Our next topic is secured transactions. And I use that generally right here as our topic of secured transactions because a creditor gets some sort of security for their, pro or for their loan or for their credit that they're extending to a debtor. I use that very generally here, but there's actually a specific definition for a secured transaction. I'll expand on that in a minute. But before we jump in to those secured transactions, as we talked about in the last topic, people and businesses, they enter into contracts for a number of reasons, uh, especially for the sale of goods. In a lot of cases, credit is extended to individuals who could not possibly afford something outright, like a car or a home or a big appliance. And the creditor would extend credit or maybe a bank would give a loan, but they're not just going to do that on a promise. You know, I promise to pay you back the debt that doesn't really give them much assurance or any guarantee. Even if you have the best credit in the world, you know, if a creditor, if you go in, loans you a bank, a bank loans you 10 grand to buy a car and you sign a contract that says, I promise to pay you back with three years, you know, within three years and with interest, the bank's going to want some sort of assurance that they're going to get paid, even with the best of intentions and the best credit report or history that you may have. You may lose your job, you may get ill, and then what? You know, and then you don't pay your bills, and then the bank is stuck with this promise. So we have this uh, concept of security. They want some sort of security. So in any of those situations, um, like I said, a creditor might be stuck holding the note, but not when we come to... Uh, a secured transaction and what they look for is a uh, an agreement that they are going to have some form of security relative to the property that you're seeking to buy with their credit or their loan so without further ado we have security for creditors in two forms we have by agreement where the parties agree to do that and uh, it's in three three types personal property security a surety ship, a mortgage for a real estate. Uh, we'll talk about mortgages. The next is the next topic. So for now, when we're talking about secured transactions, we're going to be talking about personal property security and surety ships. Mortgages will be the next, uh, the next time. And the other way is by operation of law. And by operation of law, you know, security is obtained through what we call a lien, a court, you know, uh, by operation, say a court will put a lien on. In a case, liens will, but sometimes by operation of law, by a statute in a state, uh, certain creditors are allowed uh, a lien, and we'll talk more about uh, the the lien process in a little bit. But generally, a lien is an encumbrance upon property that secures a payment for somebody. Um, all right, so so the first form we're going to talk about personal property security, and that's our secured transaction. When I talk about it as a, a singular, it's any transaction in which the payment of a debt is guaranteed by personal property. And that's the one that we're all very familiar with, buying a car, uh, you go to a bank, you take out a loan, and the bank retains a security on the car. You don't pay the car, pay for the car, they have options. And we'll talk about those options too. So this is the one that we're all very familiar with, and there are five components of a secured tra transaction. Uh, first, we'll talk about the nature of the property that can be subject to a security interest. We're going to talk about the uh, methods or how a security interest is created. We're going to talk about perfecting the security interest, interest against other claims. And when I use SI, I'm talking about security interest because I don't want to just keep typing that out. So when you see SI, means security interest. So perfecting the security interest against other claims, that's when we have steps to protect it from other folks who may come in and try a claim, make a claim against that car or, you know, that appliance. So there's a, a process involved that a creditor has to take regarding that. Uh, and then there's also this concept of priorities among the secured and unsecured creditors who's going to get first grabs at the property. You may perfect it and say, hey, I have a claim on this, but then you have to put yourself in the pecking order. And we're going to talk about that. And then we're going to talk about the rights that the creditors have when the debtor actually defaults. 
So, what rule governs? All the, the, the laws regarding secured transactions are found in the Uniform Commercial Code. We've already talked about the Uniform Commercial Code and we talked about sales. We were talking under uh, Article 2 and 2A for leases. And secured transactions are found in Article 9 of the UCC. Now there are a number of definitions I'd like for you to be familiar with. They're actually uh, in the book. The reading material on this topic is pretty um, spot on. I expanded uh, on some of the uh, some of the terms and some of the uh, discussions in there, but I thought that the material was pretty clear cut in this area. But so if you, I'm going to give you some shorter versions of the definitions or paraphrase the definitions that are in the book here, make them a little bit more understandable because I think the ones in the book actually quote the UCC language. You don't need to quote it word for word. You just need to know what these things are. So security interest. Uh, an interest in personal property or fixtures with secure payment or performance of an obligation. That's really what it is. An interest in personal property or fixtures which secures payment or performance of an obligation. And then we have a secured party. And generally that's our creditor, right? Secured party is the creditor. Could be a lender, could be a seller, or any person whose favor there is a security interest in. It's usually, you know, the lend lending of the money and taking of the interest. That's how that works. And then we have our debtor, and that's the party, or could be a person, could be a business, but it's a party who owns, pay, who owes the payment or performance of that secured obligation. And then we have a security agreement, and the security agreement is the contract that creates or provides for the security interest that's between the debtor and the secured party. Or you can refer to that person as the secured creditor. Um, I use them interchangeably, you'll probably see that here. So the security agreement is the agreement between those two parties. Then we have this uh, purchase money security interest. This is the most common form of security interest. And we usually see it in consumer goods, but we can see it in other, in other ways too. And it's created in two ways. The security interest in an item is sold on credit or a security interest in an item is provided for in a loan to buy the item. For example, um, let's say you go to the bank to buy the car. You go to G, you know, the local McBride Della dealer here in town, you're going to buy a Subaru, but you can't buy it outright. So you get a lender, they help you find a lender, you get a lender and you loan $20,000 to buy the car. They give you the $20,000, you can buy the car, and then they hold a security interest in the vehicle. Sold on credit, let's say you go down to the college bookstore, I think this is the example in the book. You can't buy the, the book, maybe the book costs $200 and the bookstore makes a deal with you, is like, well, we'll let you take the book on credit, but you have to bring it back in perfect condition. You don't, nobody's giving you money. Not, not, you don't get the item, but you have to bring the item back. They have an interest still in that, uh, in that book. So you'll see that in other examples as we go along in, in bigger forms when we're talking about big companies that maybe have extended credit and banks and so forth. But that's in the, in the general sense, the purchase money security interest involves these two things. And then we have the term of collateral. We've all heard that term before. It's the property that's subject to the security interest. That's the general term for collateral. And then we have a whole bunch of defined further terms. So let's kind of run through those pretty quick. So we have, I have them in groups. I think the book puts them in groups. We have tangible, indispensable paper, and we have intangible. Let's start with tables. And we have goods. We have a broad definition of goods. We've talked about goods and we talked about sales. It's tangible property. It's all things that are movable when the security interest attaches. So this could be fixtures. It could be standing timber to cut and re cut, that's going to be cut and removed. It could be unborn animals. It could be crops that are grown or they're currently growing or they're going to be grown. And manufactured homes fall under this category of generally goods. And why manufactured homes? Just on a side note, it's different from real estate. 
real estate where there'd be a home, the difference is these manufacturer homes can be moved. So they actually come with a title. So they're going to fall under goods. Then we have a specific category for consumer goods. Consumer goods are primarily used or bought for personal, family, or household purposes. So if you see a consumer good, a big refrigerator, an oven, something of that fashion, something, you know, maybe a very large flat screen TV, if it's used for personal, family, or household purposes, consumer good. Then we have equipment. And this is goods that are purchased for use in business. We have inventory. Farm products don't fall under inventory. They have their own category. So inventory includes goods that were purchased for sale or lease to a third party. So let me run through these as an example real quick. Think of a computer. If I purchase a computer for use in my home, it's a consumer good. If I purchase a computer to use for my business, even if it's my home business, then the computer is going to be considered equipment. And if I purchase the computer to resell at my computer store, it's considered inventory. So you see how these things uh, differ. And I want that to be clear that they differ because it's going to depend on what the security interest is and where they're going to fall in the pecking order. So. There, that's why we have these differences. We can't just have a lump sum of goods, and here's what happens. Uh, fixtures. Fixtures are goods that have been attached permanently or relatively permanent to real property. These would be things like windows, furnaces, central air, plumbing. Uh, and we'll talk more about that item when we talk about mortgages. And then we have farm, farm products. And these are goods purchased on a farm, such as livestock or crops. Okay, Different than the goods crops because you can sell crops, like I can sell crops, I can have a garden that I do kind of on the side and maybe to co-op buy some of my goods, but I don't operate a farm. So make sure you kind of distinguish between uh, those two concepts. But most of what we are going to talk about is the one that we are very all familiar with, and that's the uh, purchase money security interest involving the right down the middle of the road, consumer goods, equipment, and inventory. And when we talk about mortgages, we'll deal with fixtures. Then we have this concept of indispensable paper. What do I mean by indis indispensable? You need it. The paper is necessary for the transferee to access the value. Okay? It's ev usually evidence, collateral evidence by, by writing, but you need that writing in order to uh, make the transfer or get your item. So let's talk about this for a minute. We have instruments. And these include things like negotiable instruments. And I know we haven't talked about negotiable uh, paper yet, but the common ones, checks, certificates of deposit, notes. I lump stocks, bonds, investment securities all under uh, instruments. You need these things to transfer them. You have to hold them to transfer them. You just don't have them willy-nilly. Documents. Titles, bill of lading, and warehouse receipts. We've talked about uh, those things when we talked about risk of loss. And then we have this concept of shadow paper. Chattel paper. It's a writing that provides evidence of monetary obligation and the security interest in the good. So it's the paper that receipts the indebtedness. And I'm going to give you an example of that one. So a debtor borrows $10,000 from creditor and creditor takes a security interest in two ATVs that the debtor uh, owns and has stored in a warehouse. Actually, let's look at my example right there. Debtor borrows $10,000 from creditor and creditor takes a security interest in two ATVs the debtor owns and has stored in a warehouse and the debtor defaults. Creditor has a right to possession of what? They don't have the ATVs. They certainly can get the ATVs. And how do they do that? They need an indispensable paper. And when we talked about risk of loss and we talked about warehouses that hold property, they're looking for a warehouse receipt. So in order for the creditor to take possession of those two ATVs, what do they have to have? They have to have the document. They have to have the warehouse receipt. The bailee, or the warehouse, won't let the creditor take those ATVs without that receipt. 
So once the credit, if the creditor has those pap that paperwork, which they should have gotten from the borrower or the debtor, they can walk or go to the warehouse and uh, take access to the ATVs and then do what it needs to do relative to get paid. Creditor car company sells David Debtor an automobile and takes a note and a security interest. Okay, this is what a purchase money security agreement is. We got a loan, which is in the form of a note, and we have a security interest. And it, when we talk about agreements, I'll tell you what we need for the agreement. For, but for the sake of our discussion of this term, the question is, what is the collateral? What is the, what's securing that loan in this instance? The automobile, right? The automobile. So now, the creditor car company buys a new hydraulic lift from lift company and grants lift a security interest in the debtor's note and security agreement to secure the creditor's car debt to lift company. So what's the collateral in this example? This would be the chattel paper. The chattel paper, now comes the collateral. Okay, now hopefully that makes, makes sense because this is how these things work in the, in the business world. And we are just talking about the terms right now. We're going to get into the, the nitty gritty. So in the first instance, consumer person goes in, gets their car loan, buys their car, and the lender has a security interest in the car. But then the car company now buys something else and is using that note and security to secure their, uh, their debt to, in this case, Lyft company. And it is a security because they're banking on that debtor paying their, their note and that it's secured by the car. And we'll talk about who will ultimately, in this kind of scenario, who would ultimately get the car in the event that David Debtor defaults. But I'm not going there right now. Right now we're talking about the terms, but we'll get there. And then we have intangible property. And these are neither goods or indispensables. Uh, these are things like accounts. I, I will lump them all together for the purpose of this, court, uh, this uh, course. And I think the CPA exam lumps intangibles all the accounts all into one uh, which would include accounts receivable the right the right to receive any sort of payment accounts receivable this could be something like insurance policies lottery winnings uh, an outside promissory note an interest in a business entity uh, it could be a, a claim in a commercial tort um, claim let's say uh, there you're involved in a breach of contract and it looks like you are going to win some sort of settlement. That settlement can become uh, a, something that could be secured versus in a personal injury. If you're injured in an accident, the, the proceeds from that cannot be uh, considered intangible property. It has to be commercial tort. Um, my question is though, what's the difference between these accounts and indispensable paper? For indispensable paper, the writing is needed. You need that to make the transfer. You need a check to make the transfer. You just endorse it appropriately. Here, these things might be in writing. My lottery winnings might be in writing. Promissory note might be in writing. Insurance policies are usually in writing. Your liability or claim that you're going to get in a commercial tort settlement will be in writing, but you don't need the writing. You don't actually need the writing to be delivered to you for the transfer to be effective. What happens in those instances? It's actually just the rights are assigned. And we talked about assignment a few classes back, but you just assign your right over to them. And then we have the general intangibles. Anything else that might be considered collateral, such as intellectual property, uh, goodwill, maybe rights and software. Uh, so anything else that are general uh, intangibles would fall under that category. Financing statement. I may have uh, distributed, I think I distributed one of these in the last, uh, in the last topic. Uh, this gives notice to the public that the creditor has a security interest in the collateral belonging to the, to the debtor. And uh, we're going to talk more about this 
uh, financing statement, we talked about perfecting. This is the key document you need to perfect. Uh, I'm going to attach another example form uh, on Moodle. And uh, you'll see there's also a link to the New York State website uh, where this UCC stuff gets filed. Uh, but you can search. You can search that the whole point is being able to search who has a uh, lien on whose property. And I'll explain that a little bit more when we're doing uh, the perfection. It's actually pretty neat. You can go in and plug in people's names and see if there's any, uh, any of their items that have a security interest attached to it. So uh, financing statement, it's the document that gives notice to the public that the creditor has a security interest and collateral belonging to the debtor. And it's uh, to the public, so it has to be filed somewhere and it'll be uh, filed in the proper, proper public office. And we'll talk about which ones those are in, in a minute. So now we're going to talk about creating a security interest. There's five things. Uh, before a, uh, a creditor becomes a secured, prop prop a secured party, it must have a security interest in the collateral of the debtor. So there's five things. Requirements that must be met for a creditor to have an enforceable security interest. These, uh, well, these are the first four. The agreement must be in writing unless the creditor has possession of the collateral. And that's called a pledge. When, they, when a creditor actually has possession of the collateral, they call that a pledge. They must have an agreement that's signed by the debtor. The creditor's signature is not needed, but the debtor, debtor's signature is. You must have a reasonable description of the collateral, and the secured party must give value uh, to the debtor. So usually it's in the form of a direct loan or a commitment to sell on credit, but the secured party must give value to the debtor. So what about this one? David already owes $5,000 on a previous unsecured debt to S. And subsequently, David signs a security agreement giving S an interest in some furniture owned by David. And the question is, you might be looking at this and saying, well, wait, isn't that a modification to their contract? And can they do that? Sure, they can. Well, in this instance, it's, uh, we don't know what the $5,000 is for, whether it was for a good or a service. So if it's a service and it's common law, then you need additional consideration to modify. If you got the sale of goods, then um, modification's okay, and if there's good faith. But in this example, we don't know, and I purposely put that there for us not to know, because the $5,000 that is already owed is enough to create this uh, security interest. So we're satisfying requirement number four in that value, secured party must give value to the debtor. We can reconsider, yeah, you got value, you got $5,000, that's, I gave you value. And now I want a security agreement. For whatever reason, they're modifying this. Maybe it's to say, hey, can I have an extension of time to pay? And S might say, only if you give me a security interest. But what my point is here is that a security for a total or partial satisfaction of a pre-existing claim is enough to satisfy requirement four, which is the value. We'll talk more about consideration in a little bit. And then number five, the debtor has rights and collateral. They don't need title necessarily. They just have to have rights in the collateral. So once all of these are met, then the security interest is enforceable. And we call that process of meeting one, two, three, four, five, attachment. So it's the process by which the security interest in property of another becomes enforceable. So Mary obtains a loan from a bank to purchase a sofa. 
she signs a security agreement granting the credit union a security interest in any sofa that she will buy with this loan and the question is has attachment occurred well one we have an agreement and it's in writing because she signs it and we have her signature and we have a reasonable description a sofa she can buy that she's getting this loan to buy a sofa she doesn't have the sofa yet but when she buys one the security interest in that sofa will become the security uh, the collateral so has attachment occurred yes it has occurred uh, once she actually it occurs once she gets the uh, sofa so once Mary obtains the sofa the security interest will attach but this also establishes my number five the title right she didn't have title she can create a sufficient uh, uh, rights to it her rights attach when she buys it and of course when she buys it she'll have title but she doesn't necessarily need to have uh, the title and attachment occurs when she purchases it purchases the sofa so then we have Roma who applies for a credit card at Target. The application contains a clause giving Target a secured interest in any goods that Roma buys with the card until she pays for them in full. So do we have an agreement? Yes, we have an agreement. It's signed in writing because that's what happens when you apply for a credit card. You make an application. Uh, and there's a clause giving Target a security interest in any goods do we have a accurate description reasonable accurate description sure it's any any goods that she buys using the target credit card right is target giving value yes they are giving value they're giving her whatever the um, the uh, credit limit is on the target card and do we have debtors rights yet do we have uh, rights in the goods yet when does that happen? When she buys them. And then that's when attachment will occur, when she buys them. And she'll have to pay for them in full, or Target can come and take those away if she doesn't pay her uh, credit card. But we'll talk about more of that process in a little bit. So we have creating the uh, security interest. That's how we go about creating the security interest. You must have those five things, the agreement in writing, Signed by the debtor, reasonable description of the collateral, the secured party or the secured creditor, giving something of value, and the debtor must have some rights in that collateral. We move on to perfecting a security interest. In a security agreement, the debtor and creditor agree that the creditor will have a security interest in the collateral in which the debtor has the rights. Okay, we just went through that. In essence, the collateral is what secures the loan and ensures the creditor of payment should the debtor default. And usually the creditor will have the right to repossess goods and then maybe sell for outstanding debt. We'll talk about that when we talk about the creditor rights. But even though a security interest has attached, the secured creditor has to take steps to protect its claim to the collateral in the event of the default because there could be other creditors buying for this same collateral. Okay, so in the attachment issue that we were just talking about, we were focusing on rights between creditor and debtor. When we talk about perfection, we're focusing on the rights between various other parties that may claim an interest in the same collateral. So what is perfection? It's the method by which a secured party obtains priority by notice that his or her security interest in the debtor's collateral is effective against the debtor's subsequent creditors. Okay, that's our book definition. Uh, let's see how it works. This doesn't mean, this is, basically we're putting them on notice. This is what we use that UCC form for that uh, is attached in, in Moodle. Hopefully, maybe you want to pull it out and look at it for discussions uh, here 
that document is certainly the one that um, most uh, folks use that I'm aware of in this area. Uh, and it has some things on there that are a little over and above what's needed. And let's talk about what's need. Well, let's talk about the three ways and then we'll talk about what's needed. Uh, there's three ways to perfect, four ways to perfect. Um, yeah, I don't know. I got a typo. There's four ways to protect. I think I wrote it that way initially because I put, you'll see later on in the slide, as I put the perfection by possession and control in the same category. But technically, there's four ways. Uh, filing a financial statement, perfection by possession, perfection by control, and automatic perfection. And I kind of treat possession and control in the same category, and you'll see why when I discuss it. Financial statement. This is the most common way. Uh, it has to include, under the UCC, it has to include those two things. Name of the debtor and the secured party and a description of the property. Right? This is going to say who has dibs, like who's, who has dibs on what, what property. Obviously, when you look at the form, you got the address of the parties. You might have a signature line. Uh, the signature line is not even is not required of either party, not even the debtor. Debtor signature is required on the security agreement, but this is just a notice form. This is to put people on notice that this particular creditor has a security interest in a specific debtor's property. So where do you file? Usually it's the Secretary of State. In New York, it is the Secretary of State. There might be another appropriate government, such as a local or county clerk's office, um, where the debtor primarily resides, would have to uh, file. What's the point? What's the point of filing? Why are we filing? Like I said, it allows creditors to look up and see if the collateral has been offered up before. Um, you can go to the website and do a search. That's how people look uh, folks up. You might think, why would someone have two collateral, uh, one item with two creditors using the same item as collateral? It could be a very large piece of collateral that's worth $100,000, but you know, one loan is for $3,000 and another loan might be for $2,000. You can still use the same collateral because of the value of the collateral. Effectiveness, how long does it last, your filing, your notice? For five years from the date of the filing, not from the date when the security interest is signed or when the debtor got the loan or when the debtor got the property. It's five years from the filing of the document. But it can continue. You can file a, financial, a, a continuation statement if it's filed within six months of the expiration. And this can go on indefinitely. Go on and on and on and on. It can be filed. So the question now is, well, what if the financing statement is filed improperly? Does it invalidate the perfection? Well, if the error is minor, then it doesn't invali invalidate the statement if it's minor. As long as the key is it can't be misleading. You can't mislead uh, someone in the statement, let's say it doesn't describe the property accurately or there's extra papers that are attached to it that are not referenced in the initial form. If you're trying to mislead, then it's going to be deemed invalidated. Uh, or if you got the debtor's name wrong, that's going to be uh, a big boo-boo. But minor errors, not going to invalidate it. And here's our perfection by possession or control. Possession of the collateral must be in the actual possession of the creditor. So for example, Clint needed some extra cash. He took his saxophone to the pawnbroker. The pawnbroker loaned Clint a hundred bucks and took the saxophone as collateral. That makes sense when you actually have a tangible good, but what happens if you don't have a tangible good? So it's collateral that cannot physically be possessed and that's our perfection by control. If it's an, electro an electronic document, or maybe it's a deposit account, or maybe it's investment property. If you have control, possession by control. See how I, why I lump them together? They're kind of the same, just depends on if the property is tangible or intangible. 
And does the secured party have a duty when they're possessing or controlling this collateral? Yes, they do. Reasonable care to preserve that collateral. They can't damage it or let it get lost or let something happen to it. They have to have some reasonable care in preserving the collateral. If we're talking about a big item, big tangible item, the, the creditor can very well charge a reasonable expense to have to do uh, anything, maybe storing the collateral or keeping the documents if they incur any expense. That is something that they can charge to the debtor. Automatic or on attachment. Uh, the book doesn't explain this one well for some reason, and this is kind of a, a big deal. Uh, so once attachment happens, when we meet all those conditions of a security, uh, creating a security interest, perfection can be accomplished automatically. It's accomplished upon attachment, basically, and this is uh, when you're only dealing with a purchase money security interest for consumer goods. So items sold on credit or by loan, and it's a consumer good, you have automatic perfection. When you, you don't have to file anything, you have it automatically as soon as you get your security agreement. There are exceptions. Doesn't apply to motor vehicles, boats, or trailers, okay? Those things are perfected differently. They're perfected by a lien and a certificate of title, and that's filed with the state, so that, that's different. So for example, uh, B buys a refrigerator for his home from Friendly Appliance Dealer on credit. Friendly has B sign a written, uh, oops, I actually got it right there. All right. Friendly has B sign a written security agreement. So the question is, do we have an agreement? Yes, I say we have uh, an agreement. And it's signed by B, who's our debtor. We have a description of the property. We do. It's a refrigerator. Is there something of value that our uh, secured creditor or our secured, I don't know, CP, I put it in there wrong, secured, should be SP, secured party, value, yes, on credit, buying it on credit, does B, the debtor, have rights? Yes, in the refrigerator, he's going to take ownership of it. So we have attachment, right? Do we have perfection? Yes, we do. It's automatic in this instance because this is the purchase money security interest for a consumer good, right? It has to be a consumer good. So let's talk about some issues that may arise. B purchases a washer and dryer from Deere Appliances for use in his home, giving Deere a security interest. Then B sells the washer and dryer to C for a fair price for C's household use. Maybe C's his neighbor. C is unaware of the security interest that Deere has in the washer and dryer. And this may all sound familiar to you because we've talked about these examples and we were talking about risk of loss. And this is where this kind of comes into, into play. So does Deere have any rights against C? And I'm going to stretch you back here. What did we call C way back when we were talking about risk of loss in this kind of instance? We talked about C as a subsequent bona fide purchaser. So what happens here? D has a security, well, Deer has a security interest in that washer and dryer. Can Deer go and take it away if B doesn't pay the loan from C? Can he take, can D take it? No, cannot does not have any effect on C. And here is why. Because when we're, in this instance, we're dealing with the consumer goods and we're using, um, there's a purchase, so we call that a purchase uh, money security interest for consumer goods. His perfection was automatic, which means he didn't file anything. But when we were talking about filing, the purpose of the filing 
is to put people on notice of security interests in property. So in this instance, C was unaware of the security interests. One, B didn't tell him. Two, how is he going to know? Because even if he went and looked it up, it wouldn't be there. No notice would be there. So Deer has no rights against C in this instance. C takes the washer and dryer free and clear, and D, Deer is either stuck holding the note or will have to sue B for the debt. However, if Deer had said, sure, I get automatic perfection, but you know what? I want people to know that I have this security interest, so I'm going to file it anyway. They don't have to file it. They're going to file it anyway. Had he, Deer filed it, then whether or not C actually did a search or B told him, by the act of it being public and putting people on notice by filing, Deer would have a right to claim the washer and dryer against C. Hope is that hopefully that follows. You, you, that makes sense. Uh, maybe you want to run through it again. So it's clear that you should probably file your financing statements regardless of whether it's an automatic exception. All right. So if D files his financing statement, then C is going to be uh, on notice whether he actually did the search or not. And what I say in, in here on this slide, you know, if C is aware of the security interest, he takes the item subject to the security interest. And when I say he is aware, the fact that he doesn't look it up and says, oh, I didn't know, the fact that it's, filed, it's been filed, that constitutes notice to him. And it's his fault that he didn't look it up, okay? And I'm also noting here on this exception that B was not a merchant. We're going to talk about that situation coming up next. So what I mean, let's talk about this. If C is aware of the security interest and he takes the item subject to the security interest, what does that mean? Does that mean he has to now pay B's debt? No, he doesn't have to pay the debt on the loan. That's B's problem. But if D doesn't pay the debt, it becomes C's problem because Deer can come and take the washer and dryer and C is out of the money that he paid to B unless he decides to sue B, okay? Or pay for the washer and dryer himself and then sue B. So that's how that will uh, work itself out. Scope of the security interest. What is the scope? The security interest can cover various types of property that we already talked about. In addition to collateral that's already in the debtor's position or could come in the debtor's position, uh, possession. And that happens in three ways. Proceeds of a sale of the collateral, after acquired property, and future advances. Okay, I think the book calls this floating, floating liens. It allows a secured party to acquire security interest in goods that the debtor acquires in the future. And just understand that these concepts exist. We don't have to call it a floating lien. I don't think I've ever used the term floating lien. I used those three terms that I just told you. So proceeds, that's straightforward enough. What's received when collateral is sold, exchanged, or disposed of, okay? Whenever, uh, whatever's received when the collateral, collateral is sold, exchanged, collected, or disposed of, the creditor takes a secured interest. For example, the creditor takes a secured interest in a debtor's sailboat. Uh, the debtor sells the boat and buys a garden tractor the secured interest attaches to the tractor, okay? A bank has a perfected security interest in the inventory of a retail seller of heavy farm machinery. The retailer sells a tractor out of this inventory to a farmer, or should be to a farmer, who is a buyer in the ordinary course of business. The farmer agrees in a security agreement with retailer to make monthly payments for 24 months. So we have two security interests happening here, okay? So we have a bank has a perfected security interest in the inventory of the retailer of all the heavy farm machinery. And then we have a, the retailer selling a big tractor to a farmer who's buying it 
with security in, in the tractor. So you, this is a very common, this is how business works, right? When we're gonna buy big things, we're going to store that sells big things. And certainly that store or retailer does not own every single piece of property in their store or on their lot. In some way, there's a security interest over it. So when you go shopping and you're out and about, even clothing stores, there's, there's probably some sort of uh, security interest over the inventory that you're buying there. So common example. So two months later, retailer defaulted on the bank loan. Is the bank entitled to the payments the farmer owes the retailer? And the answer would be yes. Payments are proceeds. Right? They are what the retailer was to receive for the collateral. The bank has a, as a secured party as the has the interest overall, so the bank is certainly entitled to have the, the proceeds. After acquired property, this is property of the debtor that is acquired after a secured creditor's interest in the debtor's property has become created. So let's take an example here, very common. Arnie buys factory equipment from Bronson on credit, giving us a security interest in all of his equipment both what he is buying and what he already owns. This is a typical after acquired property example. Six months later, Arnie buys equipment with cash from another seller. Is that equipment a security interest to cover credit with Bronson? Yes, it is. Future advances. This is basically a line of credit and security agreement. The security agreement calls for the collateral to stand for both present and future advances of credit without additional paperwork. It's a continued line of credit. Uh, the collateral will stand, like I said, for both future and present advances. There are several examples in the book on this one. I'll let you guys refer to that rather than go through them all right here. We still have a lot to cover, but that's um, future advances. Think of it as a line of credit, no further paperwork. That's the point of it. So priorities, who gets priority? We have our attachment, we have our perfection, meaning attachment, I got my security interest, perfection, look, I'm putting everybody on notice, and now it's like, so who gets priority? When one or more of the party, when, when more than one party claims an interest in the same collateral, who gets first dibs? Why is this important? Why is priority important? because frequently the value of the collateral is insufficient to pay all the creditors. And the first creditor gets paid in full usually before the lower priority creditors receive anything. So it's very important because you don't know where you're gonna fall in the, uh, the pecking order and first come first serve, first one usually is gonna get paid because the collateral is usually not, uh, it's, the value of the collateral is usually what you get for the loan. So who, how does this work? What are the rules? Generally, uh, it's the party who has perfected security interest that will have priority, okay? So if somebody has perfected, i.e. filed, they will have priority. But let's talk about perfected security interests versus unperfected security interests. What do we have? So the one who perfected first. So if you don't, so you have some, that's my general rule. Perfected security interest people have priority. So if you're unperfect, unperfected versus perfected. Remember our washer and dryer folks? You might have automatic perfection, but you're really gonna depend where you fall in the pecking order. What if there is a conflict with these unperfected? We have two unperfected meaning neither one of them filed, then it's gonna be the first to attach or be created that has priority, first in time. And what if there is a conflict between the perfecting folks when one or more creditors have perfected interest in the same collateral? First in time, the first to perfect has priority. but we have a lot of exceptions to the rules. So let's talk about them, okay? 
A very important exception is going to arise if one party's perfected interest is a purchase money security interest. Okay, they are going to get superior priority status if one of the parties perfected interest is a uh, purchase money security interest. So let's talk about the different ones because there's different ones and they have different rules. If we are talking about a purchase money security interest in equipment or consumer goods, so the collateral is important, uh, equipment or consumer goods, the secured party has 20 days after debtor receives possession to perfect the security interest, the purchase money security interest. So let's talk about uh, an example and I am going to refer you to an attached sheet of examples because it's way too much to type in a little slide. So there's attached examples. I'm going to go through it. Um, the first one, Billy versus Fred. I don't know what actual number it is on the sheet. So Fred agrees to buy Billy's furniture store. Billy financed the sale himself and took a security interest in all current inventory and equipment and all after acquired inventory and equipment. Billy filed a financing statement covering this transaction on June 1st, 2010. On May 29th, 2011, Fred purchased and took delivery of a new computer from Mega for use in his store. Fred purchased the computer on credit and entered into a security agreement with Mega, giving Mega a security interest in the computer that Fred had purchased. Mega filed a financing statement covering this transaction on June 10, 2011. If Fred defaults on his payments to Mega and Billy, who has priority to the recently purchased computer. So the analysis on this, although Billy's security interest in after acquired equipment arose first, Mega has a purchase money security interest in the computer and she perfected within 20 days in that 20 day window. So Mega is going to repair, uh, prevail in here, the situation. If Mega waited until say June 25th to perfect uh, its interest in the computer, Mega would have a purchase money security interest, but it would not gain the priority over Billy because Mega did not perfect within the 20 day window. Okay, see how that that works and how perfection is important. And then we have number two example. Well, we have number two rule and then we'll have number two example. Under, uh, actually I have another example. The other example, I think it's right under the same sheet under article nine, it starts with under article nine of the UCC. What is the order of priority of the following security interests in the store equipment? I'm going to let you guys work that one out. I'm going to give you, uh, I'll give you the answers to that and some of the other ones that are on in a separate uh, video, but try and work that one through yourselves. We're going to move on to number two, the purchase money security interest and the goods we're dealing with are inventory. So the uh, purchase money interest party must perform two tasks in order to gain priority over the earlier perfected interests. And these two things have to happen. Perfection occurs before or at the same time to the debtor receiving the inventory. And you have to give written notice to all the holders of a prior perfected security interest in the collateral prior or simultaneously of the debtor taking debt. So all of this happen, has to happen all kind of at the same time or right before. Perfection and notice. So back to uh, the other example, should be on that sheet as well. Fred agrees to buy Billy's furniture store. Billy financed the sale himself and took a security interest in all current inventory and equipment and all after acquired inventory and equipment. Billy filed a financing statement to cover this transaction. On June 1st, 2010, Fred purchased some furniture to resell in his store from High Point Furniture Corp. High Point sold the furniture to Fred on credit and took 
the purchase money security interest and the furniture is sold to Fred. So the question is who has security interest in, the, in this example? Two folks have security interests. We have Billy and we have High Point. Who has priority? What does High Point have to do to get priority? They have to file or perfect its interest when debtor before or at the same time debtor receives that inventory and has to give Billy notice at the same time of their uh, security interest. Another, exam another exception to the rule is our buyers in the ordinary course of business. And we've gone through this when we were talking about risk. So this is our buyers buying goods from a merchant. The buyer takes the goods free and the rule is the buyer takes the goods free and clear of any security interest created by the seller, even if the security interest is perfected and the buyer knows of its existence. Do not confuse this with the example above where our B we had the uh, B selling his washer and dryer to the neighbor. Okay, this is, um, well, we'll go through some examples, but kind of step back. This is our farmer who buys the tractor from the uh, retailer, and the retailer has the, uh, there's a security interest in the inventory of the retailer. While the security and the bank who holds the security interest in the retailer's inventory can get the proceeds that the farmer is paying for the tractor it cannot take the tractor away from the buyer in the ordinary course of business why do we have this rule if buyers couldn't buy things goods from merchants free and clear of a security interest that the merchant may have on its goods and we're not going to have really the free flow of goods in the marketplace, right? It's not going to happen. So this allows purchasers to buy from merchants without the fear of these security agreements between merchants and the other parties. So most customers are buyers in the ordinary course of business. So uh, this is my, uh, this is the example. Very similar to the neighbor, but you know, cars, car dealers, they have security interests on their vehicles. And you go and you buy a car, you get a loan. Say the local credit union, the car dealer transfers you title free and clear, okay? You, the car dealer's security, secured parties can't come and take it. Let's go through some uh, other examples I, might, I have here. So I sell my washer and dryer on Craigslist. There's a security interest on the items from Sears. You contact me about buying it. You ask if there are any liens on it. I say yes, from Sears, but I plan to pay it off with the money I get from the sale. Okay, and you buy it, and I don't pay it off. Can Sears come and get it from you? I think they could, because I told you, you took it subject to the uh, security interest. You just believed me that I was going to pay it off, but you were aware, you had notice. If I said no, and Sears didn't file, because this is a purchase money uh, security interest on a consumer good, if Sears didn't file or perfect, then you'd take it free and, free and clear. If Sears did, then you're not going to take it free and, free and clear. You're a bona fide, uh, technically you're a bona fide purchaser in this instance, but uh, if you are aware of the security interest, they can come and take it. So, you know, S deals, S the dealer in stereos obtained financing from lender, L, our lender, by securing the loan with their inventory of stereos. B purchased one of the stereos from that inventory. B buys the stereo on credit from S for his personal use. We have a purchase uh, money secured interest in consumer goods here. Perfection, it's automatic. Could file, but it's automatic. Can the lender take the stereo from B as a result of the default by S? And the answer is no, they cannot because B is a buyer in the ordinary course of business. Even if the B knew of the security interest, the buyer knew of the security interest. If B sells his, and the reason for that is because this is how business works. We, it's assumed that we believe that's how business works. You're not, even if you knew, they can't come and get it. 
If B knew of the security interest in this instance, no. B sells his stereo to Ned, the neighbor Ned, for consumer use. Can S take the stereo from N? That's a little trickier. If N knew about the security interest. Probably not in this instance. But if N knew about it, then yes, S can come and take it. Other types of uh, priorities, I'm not going to go into them here. I'm going to save these for the appropriate uh, topic, subject matter. You know these exist, that sometimes these folks get high priority, lean creditors, tax lien. We're going to talk about liens uh, shortly. Uh, bankruptcy trustees, we'll talk about bankruptcy trustees when we talk about bankruptcy, but when items go into uh, bankruptcy, trustees can uh, take priority over such collateral, but know that they exist. Rights, creditors' rights on a debtor's default. Most common form of default is when the debtor fails to pay, right? Or when they file for bankruptcy, both instances, um, mostly when they fail to pay. The basic remedies that a creditor has, they could sue, they use the judicial process, or they take possession of the collateral. Let's talk about repossession. That's when the creditor can take, and I'm going to use the word peaceful, peaceful possession. This isn't Operation Repo. I don't even know if that uh, reality show is still on, but uh, peaceful, peaceful possession without having to go to court. They can take possession of the collateral without having to go to court. And what I mean by peaceful is they can't trespass on land, they can't assault people, and they can't Break, uh, break into places to get the collateral. So once they have repossessed the collateral, they can do two things. They can retain the collateral or resell it and apply the proceeds to the debt. Okay, And if there's any debt left over, they can sue. If there's any surplus, they have to give it back. We'll talk about that in a second. But if they retain it, this is what they have to do. If they re retain the collateral, they have to give notice. Notice must be sent to the debtor unless the debtor uh, signs a statement renouncing his rights. Doesn't want any more rights in it, you can have it. And they have to give notice uh, to any other secured creditor who has notified them of their interest in that collateral, unless we're dealing with a consumer good. Then you don't have to give notice. And then if either of those parties object within 20 days of getting notice, then the collateral must be sold. If there's no objection, then they can continue to retain it and do what they feel is necessary uh, regarding that property. If they're forced to sell, if they must sell or if they decide they're going to sell it, this is how they sell it. They have to dispose of it in a commercially reasonable manner, within a reasonable time. They have to do it in good faith. They could do a public or a private sale, but it's usually done in the same manner and method normally used for selling similar type of property. And they also have to notify the debtor of the fact that they are going to sell it. And there's a special note for consumer goods. If the debtor has paid more than 60%, uh, and we're talking about a purchase money security interest and it's consumer goods, if 60% or more has been paid for it, the creditor must sell the collateral within 90 days of possession or they could be subject to liability to the debtor. And when you sell it, this is how the proceeds go in this order. The first thing that gets paid are the reasonable expenses incurred by the secured party in repossessing, storing, and reselling the collateral. So that comes off the top. Then they satisfy the debt that's owed to that secured party. And then if there's anything else left, 
any subordinate security interest of creditors will get paid. And if there's more than one or two of them who's ever had priority in the perfection process is going to take second and so forth. And if after all of that, there's any money left over, the debtor will get the surplus. If after all of this, we get to number three, debt satisfaction, and there's still a deficiency, still money owed, then the secured party can sue for the balance and obtain what's called a deficiency judgment. That's a judgment against the debtor for the amount of the debt that's remaining unpaid after the collateral has been repossessed and sold. All right, so now we have this concept, our last concept, redemption. A debtor or another secured party has a right of redemption. What do I mean by that? Any time before the secured party disposes of the collateral or enters into a contract for its disposition or before the debtor's obligation has been discharged through uh, retention of the collateral, like he signed his rights away, either debtor or another secured party can exercise this right of redemption. Meaning they come in and they pay the entire debt off to the, the secured party and all of the secured party's reasonable expenses incurred up to that point, which could be you know, repossessing the property, um, paying their attorney's fees, paying any costs involved with getting to the process of where they are. Maybe they already started um, establishing the selling process, but either the debtor or another secured party has the right to come in and just pay it off and then they'd be entitled to the property. So that's redemption. Uh, go through the rest of the examples on, on the sheet. I'm going to have a separate uh, video and I'll go through those ones that I had done through the course of here again too if there's any question on priority and, and the issues raised. Uh, I think they cover all of the main ones uh, that are important. And so, yep, work through those. And then we're going to, I'm going to switch over to debtor, creditor, and surety ships.